Hello to our Pleasant Green parishioners and listening audience. This is lesson number 10 for November the 3rd, and it is still uh, Unit 3 out of our Faith Pathway Study Manual. It is entitled, the Unit 3 is, Faith Leads to Holy Living. Faith Leads to to holy living. And lesson 10 is entitled Look in the Mirror. Look in the Mirror. The devotional reading is from the book of James, verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And our background scripture is Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 11. Our printed passage also is Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And our key verse, and I'll read the NIV version, um, and it reads, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, the King James Version does not use the word test, and that is a word that we will entertain and address later in our lesson. But the King James uses the word prove your own selves. Uh, it suggests that we should prove our own selves. Uh, to see whether we have uh, failed the commission of Christ. Our lesson's aims are identify the standards of faithful living in Christ that guided the life of Paul. Since growth in faithful living by testing ourselves in Christ, embrace faithful living as the basis for communal life in Christ. Those are our lesson's aims, and our lesson is in three sections. The first is under the title, Prepare, these verses lead to preparation, and that's Second Corinthians verses 1 through 4 in chapter 13. And our second section is examine, and that would be again Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter. These would be verses 5 and 7. And then our next section would be obey. And these will be the concluding verses, verses 8 through 11. And uh, as we begin to indulge into our lesson, uh, the main emphasis of the lesson is for all of us to examine ourselves, to look in the mirror, and to see the image that is portrayed to see ourselves as ourselves, uh, not as we want people to see us, but as we truly are. Because the lesson, uh, Paul's uh, commission or Paul's mission here is to set people on the right path, the Corinthians on the right path. And to do so, uh, he had to acknowledge 
where they had faltered. He had to acknowledge the things that were impeding their progress. And that involves identifying our mistakes and our failures and then what things we need to do to correct those and to move forward and begin to progress. To succeed, to advance, and to mature in this walk. Now it is our prayer and our sincere and earnest plea unto God that that which is prepared and which is for our reading, that as we read it and indulge our thinking and inquiry into the lesson, that the things that you have already ordained and set before us would be observed and not only observed, but as well practice and become a part of our daily living. And we ask it all in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Now, I mentioned that uh, we would address the word test. And I think the best approach uh, to our uh, looking into and gaining a understanding of this word test, especially when it is used in association with God. So I think that the background or our devotional, our devotional scripture uh, best explains how we should look at what the intent is when commentaries and such uh, use the word test when we are addressing uh, scripture in association with God. And so we will let scripture speak for itself from the book of James, the first chapter, beginning at the 12th verse. And it says, or it reads, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So, uh, first here we see that uh, sometimes we wonder why certain situations or conditions present themselves to us in life. Uh, but here, uh, the scripture says that when we are encountered with different experiences in life, that we should be or uh, consider ourselves to be blessed for when we have been approved, we will receive the crown of life uh, for those uh, from the Lord, which Almighty God has promised to those who love him. So maybe we should have a different perspective or a different outlook on when different conditions, uh, situations and such present themselves to us in life. Uh, maybe our understanding or our response should not be that, why is God testing me? Why is God testing me? Well, scripture here first says that, let no one say, I'm in the 13th verse, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself tempt anyone. So, when we uh, look at certain circumstances as they arise in life, um, and as I stated earlier, uh, sometimes our response is, why is God testing me? But 
scripture has just said that God doesn't tempt anyone, nor can God be tempted by evil. See, sometimes uh, things are planned to, uh, to somewhat challenge us. Uh, sometimes there are evil entities that are involved and there, there are strategic calculations that are directed towards us just to see what our response would be. Now, when those things are orchestrated by men and women, we cannot say that that is of God. Those are individuals who choose to strategize and manipulate and conjure up certain things to try to get under our skin. And sometimes they succeed, unfortunately. But we should not say, why is God doing this? And uh, the text goes on to say that, but each one is tempted when he or she is drawn away by their own desires and enticed. See, sometimes we allow things to draw us in like a magnet. We allow ourselves to be pulled off of our pole. And uh, I'm using this in relationship to magnets having a certain attraction from the poles for our polarity. So we allow ourselves to be pulled off of the position that we hold and attracted uh, and enticed and pulled away uh, from what our location is. And so uh, the text says, and sometimes uh, when we when we find ourselves succumbed to these uh, persuasions, um, and sometimes it's because we choose to, as we say, give people a piece of our mind. So the text says, then when desire has conceived. And gives birth to sin. See, when, when we let, when we give in to it, it allows uh, corruption. It allows deceit. It allows destructive manners, sinful things. It allows them a entry to come in. And then when sin, when it's full grown, it brings about death. So the scripture says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth. By the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. See, there's a purpose that those that are called and ordained by God as God's messengers, there's a purpose for it because they bring to us the word of truth. They bring light to us. They bring direction. They equipped us to be prepared and able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the wiles of evil. So when we look into our lesson, we should not approach it as though, yeah, 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 that's right. I keep wondering myself, why is God always testing me? No, God does not test us because that is to say then that God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere at the same time, that that is to say that a powerful, divine, and holy presence and spirit such as God is, 
That is to say that that can be tempted on a level as low and lowly as we are. That is to say that all power, all presence, all knowing has to stoop to the level of I want to test my creature. I want to test my creation, even though I know what they will do before they do it, because I know the ending before the beginning. But I find joy and pleasure in testing them just to see the results. That's how I get my fun. Now, now, doesn't that sound like we're talking about ourselves, but certainly not a God? So now when we look into our lesson, uh, I will mention this uh, at the forefront of it, uh, because the first uh, verses, verses 1 through 4, are entitled Prepare, and Paul here is talking about how that he's addressing uh, different uh, matters. And, and he talks about that uh, this will be my third time, my third visit to you. And uh, uh, when I come, I'm going to have witnesses. And, and this, uh, again, establishes a leader's approach. See, uh, in our lesson, uh, we find later that Paul is compared to uh, present false teachers, false rulers, leaders. And they expect Paul to conduct himself in the same manner in which they conduct themselves and display leadership. But here Paul goes all the way back to Deuteronomy and comes back and says that, well, I am supposed to have witnesses. So, so what Paul does is, Paul says, based upon not just my own testimony, but the testimony of those that are present. Now, a lot of times, the elders will sought after to be the witnesses, because then uh, they would not be as easily persuaded or influenced by others because they've lived long enough. They've had enough experiences. They've seen the outcomes of wrong judgments and false statements. And so, therefore, uh, elders a lot of times were sought after to be the witnesses so that the, uh, the response would be bathed in wisdom and the outcome could be certain that it was not influenced or persuaded by other temptations and other forces. So Paul says, I'm going to bring some witnesses with me. And uh, just as I told you, when my second visit, I warned you about the reports and the things that I heard about the type of behavior, activity, and the types of incidents that were occurring. And so uh, I'm going to come and uh, this time, now uh, listen, listen to this part, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV. And it says, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in, witness, uh, in weakness. Now, now, a lot of people associate the fact that uh, Christ underwent uh, one of the capital punishments of the day. It was an embarrassing thing, and uh, a lot, uh, even on the day of the crucifixion, uh, they made accusations and such. Look, the king of the Jews, if he's so powerful, why don't he just, you know, come on down since he's the king and everything? You know, why is he dying this shameful death? You know, pure criminals and crooks and such, they, they uh, die 
by the crucifixion on the cross. You know, he's supposed to be the king. He's supposed to be the savior of the world. You know, uh, exemplify some strength then. It's funny how we equate our understanding of strength and then try to make it equal to how God displays strength. This is what the leaders did not understand. Still to this day, especially in this current time that we're in, look at how authority and strength is displayed. Displayed, And uh, look at the results of it. And then equate present day authority and strength and compare it to the strength that was displayed by Christ. And then let's look at the results. So uh, when Paul is being confronted with, you know, we want proof that Christ, that you are, or you met Christ. We want proof that Christ is the authority that speaks in you. You know, give us some proof. What kind of proof are we looking for? Proof of ultimatums? Proof of, if you don't do what I say, I will execute you? Proof of um, that I run it and you run around in it? Uh, what kind of proof is the present leadership and what kind of proof does mankind resort to to show that this is from a seat of power how do we view power compared to how power is displayed by god now i want to uh read just a few scriptures here um and this is going to be out of second corinthians but it's in the 10th chapter and it is addressing uh, this uh, accusation or this request from those in second uh, in Corinthians that uh, were trying to seek power based upon how they felt it should be uh, exemplified. And so I want to read what Paul was saying uh, in the 10th chapter. And it's uh, a subtitle says divine authentication. So I want to read this here uh, just so that we have somewhat of another perspective. It says, now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but but being absent and bold toward you. Here he making, he's making the distinction between himself and Christ, which is in him. Now here in the second verse, and I'm starting at uh, the 10th chapter, reading down just a few verses. It says, but I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So here Paul makes a, a, a real good distinction here because Paul identifies that I'm fighting against myself to give you a piece of my mind because in my flesh, that's what I really wanted to do. I've heard all of this talk about, you know, who does he think he is and where does he get uh, this uh, attitude that, you know, he can tell us what to do and uh, shoot. I don't know where, where he gets off. But so here Paul says, well, you know, uh, I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold. I'm begging that I don't be myself. That I don't be Paul, but with confidence, I intend to be bold against some 
who think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. Here he's identifying that uh, in my flesh, I do want to set some of y'all straight. I do want to get some of y'all uh, right according to my flesh. But then he goes on and he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God by pulling down strongholds. This is good text. This is good reading. And it says that, you know, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Because we've learned. We, we know what happens when I indulge myself. I know what the outcome is. When I stoop to the level of just uh, telling you what I think you ought to hear, well, then I, I jump right into that ring with you. And now you say, well, if that's what you think, let me tell you what I think. And now we're in a battle against who can outdo the other. Is there any fruit in that? What is the outcome that we've learned in our short journey in this walk? Well, we, you know, how does that usually turn out? Is it, is it beneficial to the Spirit of God? So then he goes on, he says, casting down arguments. So I could argue, but I cast it down. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, but bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, as a, as a contrast, here Paul says that instead of uh, exchanging word for word, st statement for statement, we bring strongholds down because we don't engage in just arguing and fussing and fighting and trying to win the argument. But we don't exalt ourselves, we exalt the knowledge of God. And then it goes on in verse 6 and it says, Being ready to punish all disobedience with your obedience is fulfilled. I'm sorry, let me uh, correct that. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now this is uh, good to read all the way through. Uh, to the uh, end of chapter 10 but as time permits in your spare time it's good reading because again our lesson is talking about the person in the mirror look in the mirror what things do we need to correct about ourselves uh, verses 5 through 7 tells us that we need to examine ourselves that uh, we need to, uh, and I hate to uh, bring uh, some uh, uh, secular overtones uh, into the conversation, but I'm certain when I say it, all of you will be familiar with it. But Michael Jackson uh, sang a song about uh, the man in the mirror, that he was looking to the man in the mirror to make a change. And uh, today, that, that song still resonates, and it's still saying that if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. Uh, it has been stated, uh, be the change that you are looking for. And so, when we uh, look at ourselves... Uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, are we uh, trusting that the Spirit of Christ is being emanated from within us? See, when we look in the mirror, we see the outer us. We don't see the inner spirit. But if we spent half the time that we spend on the outer appearance, on the outer us, as we should on the inner us, 
It would change our countenance. It would change our outer appearance. So I just want to uh, uh, close as we look at uh, uh, our last section about obey. And uh, I want to address it from verse 8. And again, I'll read the NIV. And it says, For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. That is powerful there. We cannot do anything against the truth. The truth is sought after by those who seek God. In fact, the scripture in the book of John, the fourth chapter, it says that those who worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. The truth is what sets us free. See, falsehood, misnomers, lies, falsification, all of that, that entraps us. That keeps us bound. It, 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 it locks up the spirit of God. But we should be seeking after the truth and those who speak truth. As a matter of fact, since uh, our lesson focuses on uh, Paul uh, not exemplifying the type of character uh, that uh, those in position of authority uh, displayed. He, he appeared to be weak at times, that he didn't display that he was strong and a great authoritarian and that, you know, he he was a tyrant and such. And he's taking, taking people's heads off and such. Um, but one of the things that uh, is a statement made in our uh, society is is that it says for those who speak against injustices for those who speak against oppression and such uh, it says speak truth to power so if we're speaking truth to power then which is actually the seat of real power. If truth can subdue power, then is the real power in truth or in power? And I know, I'm sure we know the answer. And so I just want to say as I close uh, that uh, those that were requesting of Paul to demonstrate some authority. Uh, Paul was uh, making visits back and forth to Corinthian, uh, to Corinth. And the issue was, what are you doing in my absence? And the request was, is that, can you demonstrate our relationship when I am absent as you do when I am present? And that is the, that's the request for us today is, are we demonstrating the presence of Christ in our daily walk, even though Physically, we don't have Christ in our midst walking and talking and teaching and preaching. But yet, his spirit is still alive. And are we personifying the Christ in us for the world to see? We pray that something has been said that shined light onto our lesson and that as always, we are not just hearers alone, but doers as well. God bless you.